during lockdown, I had a phone call uh, from my mother. Um, she's not from London, they were from outside London, and they called me because they heard about you know, the work I do. And she called me to tell me her son, her son um, had a girlfriend who was Muslim, and the girl he was seeing uh, was a non-Muslim. And she obviously found them having a relationship. And she also said that he also had doubts about Islam. Yeah, he had doubts about Islam. So she said, is there any way I could kind of help? And because of the COVID and, you know, distance, I, you know, I thought, you know, let me, let me, let me speak to him. Or let me find out. So I spoke to him. And normally, when people are involved in sins, it's not the sin issue, it's the underlying issue. What's going on underlying for me? So I spoke to him. And I didn't talk about the girlfriend. I just wanted to find out what's his stance or his understanding of Islam and so forth. And he was quite honest. You know, he had these kind of doubts about Islam. And normally it's the, the controversial stuff. And he had doubts around, you know, existence and, and he started to bring all these kind of evolution arguments and so forth. And to be honest with you, this is just one case. This is just one case. And these are cases that, that come to light. And really, this is just a tip of the iceberg on what's really going on. And hence why the title is Losing a Generation. You know, in my day-to-day -day job, I, I come across with, like, come across to, you know, hundreds of, like, Loads of young people, you know, over the last maybe 15, over 15 years I've been working with young people. And one of the common things when me and the Sheikh was talking about this, and some of the brothers who I work with, is that we're losing a generation in, one, in front of our very eyes. You know, and it's quite... It's at an alarming rate, to be honest with you. It's very alarming. I was looking at some stats, and I think there was a report in, in America. And I think they said, I think one of the reports was, um, was 23%, just a quarter, who are born Muslim, but when they become in their adult life, no longer identify themselves as Muslims. Yeah? That's 23% of the Muslim population. I think the American Muslim population is like three and a half million. So just on a quarter of that 23%, those who become adult, who are recognized as Muslims, or born Muslims, but later in their adult life, they no longer recognize themselves as Muslims. And that's in America. So imagine what's it like in the UK? Yeah, what's it like in the UK? And I was a bit apprehensive with the topic because it's quite disheartening and sometimes we could just talk about the problem. But hopefully, inshallah, by tonight, we could actually look at what are the solutions that we need to do, do as, 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 you know, as a community. I know a lot of the brothers that we talk about probably are not here. So my target audience was never them. My target audience was the brothers here because if you're already here, alhamdulillah, at least you're practicing and you're here and that was my target audience my target audience for those brothers because i know those brothers don't come to the masjid so now the question is this if we are losing a generation what are the factors that we know that we're losing a generation what are the reasons what are the drivers and when i was thinking about it you know i wasn't saying that these are the three yeah because I think the list is quite exhaustive, it's quite extensive, and people will add their own observation. But these are the things that, when I was speaking to the brothers who I work with, 
These are the top three that was coming up for us. Now we know that, okay, you know what? These are the common themes that when we look at young people, young Muslims, by the way, yeah, that are involved in, you know, that kind of certain lifestyle, yeah? What are the top three that was coming up for us? And when the first one for me was coming up was what I would like to say, how I like to say is really the diminishing of the Muslim identity. That's one of the things that really, for me, that comes up. Yeah? What do I mean by Muslim identity? I don't mean the title. Because all of those kids, every time I approach them, I say, do you consider yourself a Muslim? They say, yeah, I'm a Muslim. Yeah? Some of them even have bids. It's a trend now. Amongst the young brothers. You see them. I'm not sure if it's here, but definitely Tahir Hamlet's where I'm from. They've got their beards. They're out in masses on Eid day. They come for Jum'ah. But you see them blasting the music on the street, true or false. Or you see them with girls or girlfriends or female friends, or however you want to associate. You see that. So one of the things I'm seeing is that the Muslim identity is that it's not the title. It's not the religious symbols. For me, how I identify the Muslim identity is how we perceive the world. How we understand our existence, how we understand how we navigate in the world, what is our purpose, what is our value. So this, for me, is slowly, slowly is being stripped away. It's going. Because if you ask them, what is Islam? They might tell you the basic, but just understanding their purpose, they don't have it. Especially the value aspect, because Islamic, for me, when I look at the deen, is definitely there's values there. Values of what? Our responsibility to Allah, our responsibility to our family, our responsibility to the community. That's, that's not there. And that Muslim identity, I see from a lot of the young brothers, that is slowly, slowly stripped, is going away. And Islam is just a name, certain acts of rituals like Jum'ah and Eid and maybe Ramadan. That's what it's come down to. So now the question is this. And just on this first one, why is that? One of the reasons, one of the things I see from many of the young people is, and this is actually linked to the second point, is the being a minority in the community or in, in the country or in the West and you've got this dominant culture that's pumped into your face, what do you think that's going to happen to your psychology? That's what's happening. So when they are a Muslim and they see others who their worldview is that, do you know what? I need to get as much materialistic gain I need to build my status. I need to make myself somebody. I need to have enough wealth. And that would by, and you attain that by any means necessary. What do you think that's going to happen to your Islamic identity overall? That's definitely going to become the first thing that's going to become compromised. And how is that being pumped? It's through the, the media outlets and what they see on every day. What do I mean by media outlet? You've got these kind of, docu you know, you don't want to call them documentary, that's kind of these gang films or these series they make, right? Like Narcos and Top Boy and all of these kind of other, you know, series. And someone that's consuming that on a regular basis, what do you think that's going to happen to that person overall? They're going to watch that. It becomes imprinted in their heart because they want some of it. They start fantasizing it, imagining it, start talking about it. You know, I want that, you know, that, that's what I want. We've got to make that money. And then what happens? They start pursuing it. At the compromise of what? The Islamic values. 
And that's how really what I'm seeing, one of the top things that I see when it comes to young people is definitely the identity is slowly, slowly diminishing from that generation. And even more so with the social media, which I'm going to talk about in a bit, but definitely social media. Because how do we develop opinions? How do we develop understanding? How do you understand the world? How do you understand, you know, what choices I make? They need information, right? But if the information is not coming from the Quran, where else, or, or from, the, from our, you know, people, our leaders of the community, which is the imams and the scholars, where do you think they're getting it from? They're getting it from other people who are just like them. So social media definitely is playing one of the major parts for me, yeah? Especially in terms of my line of work when I'm dealing with gangs, most of the gangs are coming off social media. Because he took a shot at him, he made a comment, or so forth, yeah? And that's something that I've seen a lot more, is that, so all of these kind of media outlets, and definitely social media, all of this, what he's, do, he's doing, is really changing and shifting the way they understand themselves, understand the world, and understand their purpose and existence. Definitely that's that. That's one of the, that's one of the top things I think that is definitely there. Secondly, I would say, and I'm going to mention the three, the second, I think, for me, is what I call the hypersexualized and the dopamine addicted generation. Yeah? The hypersexualized dopamine addicted generation. Dopamine, if people, if people don't know, especially the young brothers, dopamine is basically a chemical. Yeah? It's from the, the field of neuroscience. And it's basically chemicals that get released in your, in your brain when you seek out, when you have pleasure, motivation, and so forth. These are just natural chemicals. But if too much of it, that's when it becomes addictive. Like gambling. Yeah? And, and, and seeing kind of haram images, those are the kind of things that get released. So imagine now, you got a young per- people, or young Muslim, they're just consumed by the binge watching, the social media feed, constantly, what do you think that's happened to his brain? Most of us, how do we behave with our smartphone? How we are, like imagine us in, with our smartphone. We struggle to concentrate. We struggle to read. Times out by a thousand for a young person. He's constantly just viewing videos of people of glorifying drugs, glorifying their certain lifestyle, yeah? Glorifying a worldview that is, again, is not aligned with the Islamic identity. And they're constantly viewing that hours on end most of the young people, when they wake up, I, go, I work in schools. So they're tired. So I said, what time do you sleep? So I slept about two, three. I said, what were you doing? I said, I was on my phone. Again, that is shifting. And what happens when, when, when young kids have lack of sleep? Their stress level goes up. They can't focus. And then their aggressive behavior comes out about because again, their, their body's imbalanced now because they're sleep deprived. They haven't, you know, they haven't got enough rest. Because why? Because they're addicted to the phone, the dopamine. And if you're watching the music videos and so forth, again, that's the hypersexualized generation. Some of these young people, like, you know, it's hard, like, especially for me, who's, you know, I work with young people, and sometimes you li- they listen to the music, and I'm listening to the lyrics, and I'm like, you're not even listening to what is being said. Or even the music videos. And what does that do? So all of these kind of dopamine and these kind of hypersexual pleasure, what does that do? It makes the body, yeah, yearn for more. It wants it. It's the same thing as the thing around the identity is that once you keep seeing that, the glance, and you're consuming it, your body just craves for it. You want it. 
They know girlfriends or boyfriends haram, but they want it. Why? Because number one, there's, that's what they've been viewing. So it's normal. So they think that's okay. And also, they don't want to look like they don't want to be feel left out. They don't want to look weird amongst their peers. So that's another reason for me is definitely that's happening. Look, and these are like, by the way, these are Muslim kids. These are kids who come from practicing home, by the way. Yeah? Not all of them, but definitely some of them. Yeah? Definitely some of them. And the third reason is what I'm finding, especially recently, I was doing um, some reading around Muslim prisoners. And it's quite interesting, the research. And then I was finding it again in my work. Is Muslims coming from broken homes. When I mean broken homes, mean, meaning single parent households who have no father figures or absent fathers. Meaning father's around, but he is taking no responsibility for his children. Very common. Very common. Sometimes I feel like, who am I trying to support? The young person or the parent? Because sometimes parents are also not taking the responsibility. And so when I was looking at the Muslim prisoners, there was a case that I think they, they kind of like done interviews for with 19 Muslim prisoners. Or 17, sorry, 17 or 19. Nine of them, all of them said I came from a single parent home. And that was one of the main factors when it came to, when they were looking at Muslim prisoners and why Muslims are in prisons. Even that stat, do you guys know the Muslims, the stats in... Imagine now, the population, prison population, 17% of the, of, the, of the prison population are Muslims. Say that again. Imagine a Muslim population, 17% of the, the prison population are Muslims. And this is what you call, this is what I call the pipeline. I mean, you've got Muslim kids who go to a normal state school or go to a school. They become excluded. They might end up in, you know, people referral unit. After people referral unit, they might be in the, the youth offending team, which is an organi you know, a, a local authority organisation that works with kids who are causing antisocial behaviour in the community. And then they end up where? The youth justice system which is kind of like, it's like an institute, prison for young people. And imagine, they've already been institutionalized, meaning they only know how to operate within the same kind of environment, telling them what to do, telling them where they can go, where they can't go, and they're just backlashing, they, they're pushing back because they can't deal with authority. And what happens? The last stop on the train line, what I call, is prison. That's the pipeline. Many of the Muslims who are in prison are going through that pipeline. And what happens when you're in prison? You just re-offend. Because you come out of prison, you've done five years, and if you, you know, those who don't know what prison is like, the prison shapes your psyche. Because remember, you're on 23 hours lockdown, one hour on social, and what does that do over time? That shapes your whole, like your essence of you. So they find it to adjust when they come out of prison. And so what do they rather do? You know what, I'm gonna go commit a crime and just go back to prison because that's what I'm used to. That's what I know, that's my comfort zone. And that's the re-offending. So for me, you know, like I mentioned, I didn't want to sit here and be like doom and gloom, but this is a reality. The reality of young people are losing their identity. Young people are being consumed with all that's out there that making them hypersexualized and becoming, you know, addicted to the dopamine. And then 
we see young people, obviously in the prison system, but the reason for that is again, because of family breaking down. Of single parent household, or the absent father. So now the question is this, which is the important part, which is, okay, what's the solution? Yeah, what is, how do we move forward as a community? Yeah, and as I was, I was mindful because I know that, um, that the brothers that we're going to be, you know, I'm talking about, they won't be here. Maybe some of them are here, I'm not sure. But I knew most of the brothers going to be here are going to be practicing brothers. And that was the, one of my main things that I really want to kind of give for a takeaway to look at us as a community. And one of the things that we really need to do as a community is really be, be proactive when it comes to this stuff. Yeah? Proactive. What do I mean by proactive? Is young people, especially those brothers, who maybe not be practicing and who are involved in their lifestyles and so forth, we need to start building a relationship with them. Yeah? Don't be afraid because they might be selling drugs and they look a bit intimidating. Because I guarantee you, when you approach them with gentleness, they'll receive it well. And sometimes they need that. Because in their lifestyle, in their circle, it's hostile. Everyone's a threat. Even though they might be boys, they might be close, but they know if it comes down to the crunch, who's going to rat on who, or who's going to take who's what. But when a practicing brother comes with no agenda, no judgment, and says, Salaam alaikum, bro, what's happening? He feels that. Because he knows you're being genuine. Because you have no agenda. You're not trying to benefit from him. And so one of the things that we need to do is really build that relationship with the brothers locally. One of the things that the brothers do, and, and, and maybe some of the senior brothers, I can see them at the back sitting. You know, when we start practicing, we want to just save ourselves. And we want to let go of the other brothers who may not be practicing. And no one thing we're looking back at it now, that's one of the biggest mistakes that we end up doing because we cut away those relationships. And then when you really try to rekindle that relationship, what do they say? They say, bro, man, I went through some tough times and you wasn't there. You didn't help me. I needed that advice. You changed your number. You didn't come and see me. And that's one of the biggest things I see from brothers. As soon as they talk about, and even I did this, by the way. Yeah, I grew up with non-Muslims, by the way. I grew up with non-Muslims. Yeah? And, you know, they've got a certain lifestyle. But over the time, I had to rekindle that relationship. Yeah? And I had to kind of, like, be amicable. Be kind. Let them know I'm here for you. Like, if you need to talk, I'm here. As a Muslim, I'm here. If you need advice. So we need to rekindle that relationship with those brothers. Yeah, on the individual level. On the individual level. Like we need to look at our own circle and who do we need to re reach out to and let them know we're here for them. You know, one of the things that in my line of work, you know, when I go into schools, first of all, they see a brother coming in with a beard. And these are young guys who probably never come across, you know, a practicing brother. And if they did, then their experience would most likely to be negative. But when I go in there with a different energy and a different intention, by the time I've worked on over 12 weeks, we love each other, man. I love the kids. Because at the end of the day, I realise that, you know what? They just don't want to be judged on. They don't want anybody to make a judgement on them. Yeah, they might be doing certain things that we might not agree with, so forth. But let me open that door so I could have that conversation once upon a, at one time. Not cut it off. And so, one of the, so that's one of the things that we definitely need to do on an individual level. On a collectively... We need to be creative and innovative the way we engage those brothers. Because we think those brothers, yeah, that we think we could invite them to the dars 
and invite them to these activities and get him to sit there for an hour and that's going to engage him. It doesn't work for everybody. I have a fascination, you know, one of my programs I do, I, I do informal education and I designed it because I know those group of young people, they failed school. So I need to teach them and give them things that's easy, easy to digest for them. So we kind of be collectively look, need to look at how do we engage those brothers and be creative about it. And sometimes you might not have the solution, but you know the solution? The young brothers. You know, when you have, you know, in Tower Hamlets, I can only talk about Tower Hamlets and talk about other communities as well because I worked in West London, I worked in different parts of London. You know, community events. Throwing a community barbecue for the brothers. Getting the brothers together and taking them away on some outdoor event because a lot of the time, you know, we did it in our organisation, you know, where I work, but that's when we took a group of brothers. These were drug dealers. Yeah? I didn't take them personally, a colleague did. They were drug dealers. No drug dealers. And we had a bit of money and they were like, you know what, let's take them away. So they took them somewhere. And you know what the brother said? They said, you know what, man, it was nice just to get out of the ends. Because they need new, new experience. And through that relationship, the brothers, they build a strong relationship. Why? Because they travel together. They act together. They got to see your behaviour. Because the older brothers were making food for them, making them breakfast for them. They're not used to it. They're not used to it. A lot of the brothers, you know, even though they're at home, no one's cooking for them. Especially if they come from a dysfunctional home. So for them to go away and the brother is, you know, looking after them, you know, um, praying together, showing them how to do wudu, just that organised activity, that's what we kind of need. And this is just one way, I'm not saying this is the only way. But the point I'm trying to say that we as a collective community need to be creative and innovative in terms of the way we engage the brothers. You know, alhamdulillah, we've got a masjid here. Yeah? And I actually initially wanted to do something here with the workshop. And because I had this workshop I, I, was, I was designing and how we could teach these brothers Islamic knowledge without being too heavy, but also in a language they understand, in a pace they understand, but in a fun, interactive way where we all j j kind of, you know, we all kind of, on a journey together. And that's just one way. But I'm saying us individually, whichever institute we're part of, whichever organisation we're involved in, whichever master we go to, we need to be proactive in terms of engaging these brothers. Because like I said, we are losing a generation. We are losing a generation. I'll leave here. Um, and I probably want to take some questions because I want to leave a big... Um, Q&A and just a discussion really because I'm not saying like you know I have all the solution and nor am I saying like the problems I identified are you know is these are the three problems there may be others as well but I wanted to kind of like open up the floor to the brothers um any kind of like discussions or Q&A's to add to that shall I if anyone's got any is that okay yeah there's loads of support out there you know and some are good, some need improvement, but we need to help them out whatever need they have. Does that make sense? You know, mashallah, like a lot of the brothers, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the amazing thing around, I want to say amazing thing around prison, but something that's come up as well, is alhamdulillah, a lot of the brothers start practicing in prison. You know, and Islam becomes part of their rehabilitation. And it's, it's there, it's there, you know, the, the research um, that I was looking into around that was there, that Islam played a big role in terms of the rehabilitation because what happens, you know, they started to understand that, you know, all the, all the basically the, the materialism that they, they were trying to attain, what was it for? Like, what did they gain from it? And Islam gave them that peace and tranquility, you know, that contentment, and made sense, I guess, for them. And they used that to kind of um, make their sentence easy, if that makes sense. You know, they, they started to have a little bit of closure to what happened. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of, like, when they come out of prison, there is, like, you know, organisations out there to support them. You know, it is recognised a lot more now that, you know, because of the Muslim population in prison, 
they are like setting up services and so forth, especially the organisation in like into Hamlets and other places where they're accommodating for more. So yeah, definitely there's out there. But again, we need to be out there. Like how many brothers, like especially, you know, I'm not saying everyone here, but I'm sure brothers know we know brothers that come out of prison. You know, I know brothers in prison. And again, regardless what they've done, that's not my job to judge, right? I'm there to be the brother and to let them know if you need any help. You know, and that, and that is our role, to really to reach out to them, yeah? Um, anyone else, any other questions? Even any other ideas as well, like in terms of what else that we could be doing as a community? You know, you want to say something, bro? Yeah. Um, I'll leave it here, because I didn't want to keep it lengthy, because, um, yeah, because the topic is not spiritually lifting. Um, I, I, I'm aware of that, you know. But just to leave on a, you know, on a positive note, um, like I mentioned, you know, alhamdulillah, a lot of the brothers, they see Islam as a way out. And we need to really sell that. We really need to, like, show them that Islam is a way out. Mashallah, like, a lot of the brothers I know later on who, many years ago, like, I see them, you know, they were doing certain things, they were involved in certain lifestyle. Mashallah, now they're practicing, their family, they got married. And so for us, it's like, we need to be, you know, you know really giving them the da'wah at early, early on, yeah, and give them that option and leaving that door of mercy open for them, really. And letting them know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kind and Allah is merciful and you could always turn back, yeah, and you could always change your ways, yeah. And also letting them know that we are here for them as well, you know, and we will support them however way they need to. So that's so important, really, yeah. I'll leave you here, inshallah. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. For the sisters, I think, and it's the same with the brothers as well, really, is really having an engagement with our kids. You know, we need to have that this whole thing around absent fathers. Because again, the fathers are like, they're doing like 60, 70 hours of working week. They're trying to, you know, provide. And some of them are genuinely trying to provide. And some of them, they want to just keep up with the status quo. Does that make sense? This one's achieving very well financially. And he also wants to achieve financially as well. Yeah? So, but at what cost does that come? Right? So one of the things that we need to do, especially for the families... Is really get your kids involved in what I call supervised activities. Yeah? Supervised activities. What does that mean? Take them to football. Take them swimming. Get involved in so many activities. There's so many activities happening locally, yeah? Yeah, they might not be run by Muslims, right? And there might be no Muslim kids there. But that is better than not doing anything because your kid's looking out the window or looking at the block and seeing those kids play, and guess what? He wants to be with them. Why? Because there's nothing here for him, here. Same with the girls, same with the sisters. Same with the sisters. And, you know, and I say to, you know, and I'm also conscious because of, the, you know, again, because my, you know, the work I do is building that relationship with our children. Yeah, building that relationship. And sometimes you've got to come out of your comfort zone. Yeah? I know some of the uncles and the dads don't want to play PS, but sometimes you might have to sit down and play the PS with them for half an hour. Because it's not the PS. When I, you know, and I say to the brother, it's not the PS. That's just a platform to have a dialogue. Are you guys with me, yeah? It's just a dialogue. Taking them football. You know, I drop my kids off in the morning. I move everything around so I can drop my kids off for that 15 minute bus. Why? Because I want to see how they're doing and building that relationship. So if I don't see them for the rest of the day, no problem. I saw them for the 15 minutes in the morning, which is the most important time for me. So we need to really build that relationship with our kids. Yeah? And sometimes as well, and, and this is going to be a controversial yeah, one, yeah? But sometimes we impose what we like on them. Right? 
So we will take them to all the conferences and the lectures because that suits us. But sometimes I feel so for the kids because there's nothing for them. And what happens is we build that negative experience so when they look back and think, well, what was your Islamic nurturing was like? They're like, well, I'll just drag them around from one conference to another conference. There's no, there nothing there. So we really need to give, and alhamdulillah, there's so many like youth Islamic like Muslim organizations now. They're doing a lot more. I don't want to mention any names, but there's so many out there, mashallah, yeah. And especially in times as well, there's a lot of the brothers are being active. Get them involved. Get them involved in sports. Get them involved in grappling. Get them involved in, just get them, like I said, supervise activities where you take them, you drop them off, they're in a good environment and so forth, you pick them up and you give them that structure. You give them that structure. Because if you don't, then don't complain why they're on their tab all day. Don't complain why they're on their phone all day. Because you have to look at yourself, what are you doing to really provide them an outlet? These are uncomfortable questions. These are tough questions. But it is about us. This is the proactive. We have to be proactive. Yeah? Hope that answers the question, inshallah, for, you know. And there is no difference between, you know, I know the sister asked, um, asked regarding um, for, the, for, for the girls. And boys. They're the same. They're going through the same challenges. They're going through the same challenges. And obviously, I'm only giving... They, the, the kind of root and the bottom of it, but there is stuff around, you know, insecurities and, you know, peer pressure and all there's a whole different dynamic that's there. And we also got to kind of like, kind of tackle it, but I don't think this is going to be one sitting. Yeah, but there is other element there. But yeah, we, I think the main thing for me always comes down to is relationships. Yeah, about building a relationship with people. So that's the parents with children or Brothers with brothers, sisters with sisters, that relationship needs to be there, yeah.